I'm pleased this evening to introduce Dave Johnson. Dave is a senior managing director and co-head of Ziegler's healthcare finance practice. Dave has over 20 years of experience and has senior managed more than $30 billion of financing transactions for U.S. health systems. He is adept at all aspects of the financing process and is the architect of a comprehensive software package that evaluates the credit profile and corporate debt capacity of healthcare systems. Dave is the principal editor of ZTOX, Ziegler's periodic commentary on issues related to healthcare finance, policy, risk management, and investment. He is a frequent speaker and author on topics related to healthcare policy and finance. Dave and Dean Nancy Kane of the Harvard School of Public Health presented their paper, The U.S. Health System, a Product of American Values in History, at the June 2008 Harvard Law School Conference focusing on our fragmented healthcare system. Dave has a P BA in English Literature from Colgate University and a Master's in Public Policy from Harvard University. Dave was an Education Peace Corps volunteer in Liberia, West Africa, and a United States Presidential Management Intern. He's a member of the Dean's Alumni Leadership Council at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government, a member of the Visiting Committee of the Harris School of Public Policy Studies at the University of Chicago, and an occasional lecturer at the Harvard School of Public Health and at the University of Chicago. Please join me in welcoming Dave Johnson. Well, thank you, Ellen, for that, uh, that wonderful introduction. Um, uh, I also, in addition to what the, all the things that Ellen listened, I did spend some time as a member of the visiting committee at, at Harvard Medical School for six years, which also had a, a, a large influence on my ability to understand how complex the healthcare industry is. Uh, anyway, the reason we're all gathered here tonight is th uh, this is the first of a three series or a three class mini course at the Harris School. Uh, the title of the mini course is The Character, Dysfunction, and Potential of American Healthcare. Uh, this is an opportune time to be talking about uh, American healthcare with the recent passage of the reform legislation. Uh, the course divides quite nicely into three parts. Um, part one will we'll discuss uh, the structure of the system and the way it got here. Part two will look at, at markets, um, how we issue debt for health systems how various uh, ways that we use to look at markets have either worked or not worked, how various ways of looking at risk have either worked or not worked. And we'll talk about uh, uh, organizational management in a complex environment and what that means, all as a, as, a, as a prelude to class number three, which will look at healthcare reform by first looking at or examining health systems around the world and comparing the U.S. system to those systems, uh, and then looking specifically at uh, the healthcare reform process, the, the forces it will leash, unleash on the industry, and the potential it will have to reshape the industry in an almost complex, uh, uh, evolutionary, bottom-up sort of way. Um, so, but first and foremost, let's uh, let's go to the unique character of American healthcare and uh, talk about its structure and how it got that way. Uh, to get us started, I've, uh, I've got a couple of quotes. Um, as, uh, as Alan mentioned, I was a literature major in college, so we have uh, one of the great first lines in all literature. It was the best of times, it was the worst of, of times, uh, from A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. And in many respects, uh, that describes the state of our healthcare system in the United States today. Uh, on the positive side, we do remarkable things in healthcare. We uh, we turn back uh, um, the the awful uh, aspects of disease on a daily basis. We understand more about the way the human body works. We develop remarkable technologies, surgical techniques, devices, drugs, and so on for treating disease and illness. We do things that uh, even 10 years ago we couldn't begin to imagine. And we're now on the verge of, of understanding the hum, human genome sufficiently that will enter an era of personalized medicine, which will, I think, in our lifetimes, dramatically reshape the way that we, uh, we interact with the healthcare system. At, at the same time, in, in many respects, it's, it's the worst of times in American healthcare. Our, our costs are out of control. Uh, the per capita expenditure of healthcare in the U.S. is almost double that of the next highest country. We have as many as 50 million people who are outside the system. Uh, there are many uh, uh, negative elements in the, in the, built into the system, a maldistribution of facilities and practitioners, um, 
sometimes too much care, sometimes not enough care. Uh, frequently, the market-oriented nature of the system means the care offered in the community may or may not uh, line up with the care the community needs. Uh, so in some respects, it's also the worst of times. Uh, second quote from Winston Churchill, you can always count on Americans to do the right thing after they've tried every other alternative. Uh, Churchill should know his mother was American, his father was British, and he, of course, was the partner with Franklin Roosevelt in, in, uh, on the al with the Allies in, in World War II. Um, and in some respects, this statement is as true about health care as it is about many other aspects. Americans try, fail, succeed, go back and forth, and, and ultimately, frequently get it right. Uh, but we haven't yet quite, got, quite gotten it right in health care, and we're going to begin to look into that in some detail. But it's also fun to begin to imagine how the forces unleashed by health care reform might begin to move us in a direction where we do begin to get it right. And the uh, final quote, uh, the aval avalanche is falling and the villagers are still square dancing below on the mountain, uh, uh, refers to the fact that th we have unleashed these major forces on the industry and yet so much of healthcare continues to operate the way it always has operated. Uh, uh, we still, by and large, depend on the general hospital to be uh, the place where we serve all, it tries to be all things to all patients. Uh, we still have primary care physicians splitting up their time in, uh, in remarkably complex and frequently unproductive ways. Um, we are desperately in need of reforming the system. The question is, will we be able to do it? So will, we, uh, will the villagers get out of the way before the avalanche comes sweeping down or not? Very, very interesting question. So broadly, two, section, uh, two sections to tonight's lecture. Uh, the structure of American health care, uh, you know, how does it work, what's it look like? And then how did we get here, the character of American health care? So let us go to the structure. Uh, the first and foremost is health care is remarkably complex. It's universal. Everyone interacts with the health care system. Uh, it's varied. There are many different parts to it. And it has multiple constituents who have vested interests in the structure and operation of the system. I've just tried to capture a bit of that here. Um, here's a range of service, everything from wellness and prevention uh, through routine and behavioral care down to acute care and disease management. So along that full continuum, a whole range of, of, of services at different points where people interact with the healthcare system. Here are some of the constituencies that have an active interest in, in healthcare. Everyone from practitioners to funders to the government to manufacturers to lawyers and consultants and so on. But even with this full range of services, even with these multiple constituencies, Healthcare fundamentally comes down to three questions, and they're very important. Who receives the care? How much care do these individuals receive, and who pays for it? So as you go around the world, and certainly as you go around this country, the answers to those three questions say a lot about the delivery mechanisms in a particular country, in a particular state, in a particular uh, city or town. Who receives the care? How much care do they receive and who pays for it? There are about 40 countries in the world that have national health systems. Um, they're very different, but they broadly fall into three models. And then there's also a fourth model that I'll talk about here in a second. But the four basic care models, and, and to get this, I borrowed uh, from the work of, of T.R. Reid. Uh, the beverage model is the, is the model in Great Britain, sometimes called socialized medicine. And that's basically where the government owns the hospitals, uh, physicians work for, for, the, for, the, uh, for the government, uh, patients or citizens in Great Britain receive treatment for free. No one ever gets a bill. It's socialized medicine. There are many other countries, including most of Scandinavia, that use that system. And here in the United States, the Veterans Administration is very much of this model. If you're a veteran in the United States, you have access to the health care system. You can enter any veterans hospital uh, in the country or even around the world. Your medical records will be available. You will receive treatment, and you will never receive a bill. That's the beverage model. Uh, the Bismarck model, named after Otto von Bismarck, uh, uh, 
the Chancellor of Germany, who actually used the creation of a welfare, welfare state in the 1880s to unify Germany from a series of city-states into one nation, uh, is, was the first uh, national health system. In some respects, is the one that probably most of you and, and certainly uh, most uh, people who have private insurance are familiar with. In Germany, uh, they have these, uh, what they're called sickness funds that employees pay into. They're basically the same as, as uh, insurance companies. The insurance companies are private. The doctors, by and large, are private. The hospitals, by and large, are private. But these groups of payers and providers come together uh, on a regular basis and negotiate the total prices or all of the prices for, for uh, health care services, top to bottom. Um, and that's a model that you see in, in, uh, in many countries, including uh, France and Japan. Uh, and as I said, U.S. indemnity plans are something like that in the sense that uh, hospitals and doctors are private, the plans are private, and then uh, the groups negotiate one another with one another uh, for prices. The difference between the U.S. system or U.S. indemnity plans and these others is that the U.S. plans, the insurance companies negotiate individually with hospitals and doctors whereas in Germany, France, and other places, hospitals and, and doctors negotiate as a whole against all the insurance companies. So there is a much more uniform rate structure. The final model, um, national health insurance model, uh, sometimes re referred to as the single payer model. Uh, it's what, uh, what Canada uses. Uh, it's also what Medicare is like here in the United States, which basically is the, uh, the government is the sole payer, uh, and it contracts with hospitals and doctors to provide the services. Government sets the price uh, and the uh, range of services. Has a very low administrative cost, um, doesn't deny claims, and is, um, is as I said, uh, um, widely, widely applied across the world, and, and most notably in Canada. Tends to be very popular in the countries and where it operates. The final model is, um, is the out-of-pocket model, which exists in uh, most of the world. So 200 countries in the world, 40 with a national health insurance system, uh, obviously 160 without. And in places where there is no automatic insurance, by and large, it's a pay-as-you-go model. Um, so the rich tend to get medical care, uh, poor either stay sick or die, and it's a, it's a, it's a very harsh model. And of course, we have elements of this out-of-pocket model here in the United States for those who don't have insurance uh, and have to access the system. So these are the four basic coverage models. Interestingly, we have elements of all four in the United States. Veterans Administration as uh, part of socialized medicine, um, the U.S. indemnity plans, which are reminiscent of the Bismarck model in Germany, and finally, uh, Medicare, which is equivalent to the single-payer model in Canada and other countries. Uh, and then we also have our fair share of, of people that don't have access to the system, so the out-of-pocket model. Um, by and large, in, the, in countries that have national health systems, the goals are, are threefold. It's keep people healthy, treat the sick, and protect patients and families from financial ruin caused by medical bills. So in most countries that have national systems, in fact, in all countries except the United States that have national systems, uh, they by and large see uh, payment for medical care as a responsibility of the state, not of the in individual. So it shifts risks from the individual to the state to the broader collective. Uh, in the United States, um, individuals and their families tend to have a greater burden for the cost of their medical care placed on their shoulders. And of course, throughout the world where there aren't national health systems, that's, that's also true. So let's take a quick look at, uh, at the United States, uh, third largest country in the world, uh, over 300 million people. Um, this is an old number, but the percent of uh, GDP spent on health care uh, as of 2006 was 15.3%. Today it's closer to 17%. Uh, per, hap per capita health care expenditure, over 7,000 and split. Um, 55-45 between private and, and government. Uh, as we just said, employs multiple structures. Uh, by and large, most people uh, purchase health in insurance through their, their employers. Uh, it has a tax advantage to it. Um, 
which is why you get what uh, some people call these Cadillac plans where uh, we, uh, where health insurance will repay for uh, replacement of hair follicles, which obviously people like me could use. 80% um, of hospitals are nonprofit or governmental. Most physicians are private, and coverage is not mandatory. Um, mechanics, uh, patients' access to specialists and services uh, varies um, according to their coverage plan, and there is great variation in that. Uh, some you need to go through a gatekeeper, so-called gatekeeper. Others you can go directly, uh, frequently with the permission of your health insurance company or the pre-approval of your health insurance company. Uh, insurance companies negotiate directly with providers. They can deny care. Most insurers are for-profit. High administrative costs. Uh, hospitals and doctors provide si significant levels of free care to the indigent. Uh, there's clearly a connection between hospitals providing free care and the tax exemption that most hospitals enjoy. Uh, concerns, um, uh, a remarkable system in many ways, including uh, how high cost it is, uh, but also um, the fact that we have 47 million people without insurance, high administrative burden. Uh, the system doesn't uh, uh, fund uh, terribly well for basic care, things like pr uh, promotive medicine, preventive medicine, disease management for chronic care patients. Uh, ver high variation between uh, uh, in uh, levels of, of care and payment. Uh, and there's both underpayment and overpayment. Uh, much of the literature in recent times is focused on the overpayment or overtreatment. Uh, and then finally, different payment rates for the same procedures. So it distorts pack practice patterns and, and facility distribution. So uh, if you happen to break your leg and you're a Medicare patient, the hospital and doctor will receive one payment. If you happen to be a Medicaid patient, it will probably be a lower patient payment. If you happen to be a commercially insured person, it will be another, another higher payment. And obviously, if you're an indigent patient, uh, there may be no payment at all. So uh, there is great variation in payment for uh, frequently the same medical procedure. So that's the United States. Um, as, it, as we look at it today, uh, uh, we have several macro trends that are influencing the system. Uh, from an operations perspective, uh, terrific uncertainty on revenue, uh, uh, and that's actually heightened by the uh, passage of, of the new health care reform bill. I think most hospital administrators would tell you and doctors would tell you they expect uh, payment for their services to decline uh, over time. There are some uh, incentives in place that will mean that that doesn't happen across the board, but uh, lots of revenue uncertainty. Tends to be a capital intensive, low margin business that requires a very highly skilled labor force. Uh, also is undercapitalized. Isn't that a recipe for a successful business? High cost, low margins, highly skilled labor force in need of capital. Um, huge productivity challenge. The ownership models are fragmented, um, meaning that we frequently don't get the benefits of scale or uh, more logical organization. Uh, that leads to suboptimal care coordination, uh, the handoffs from hospitals to nursing homes or LTACs or even home health agencies uh, frequently don't happen very well, which is why so many people are readmitted to the hospital. Uh, within 30 days of their treatment. Uh, we haven't seen uh, practice standardization, uh, wide variation in uh, practice patterns, wide variation in the cost of treatment, wide variation in the number of procedures uh, uh, in different areas of the country. All of that would benefit from more standardization. An underdeveloped IT platform, these two obviously go together. The more information system that's in place or the better the information system that's in place, the easier and more effective it is to standardize uh, process uh, and obviously to measure outcomes. Market realities, um, it's been significant disruption uh, in the last couple of years for those wanting to borrow, uh, for health systems wanting to borrow. Um, because of the nature of the practice, investor understanding of, of debt is, uh, debt offerings is not as high as it might otherwise be, certainly not as high as you would see in a, in a uh, an SEC registered uh, uh, offering that leads to higher uh, interest rates and, and uh, more covenants, greater levels of security. Um, disclosure, that's the investor cushion I was talking about. 
Access tends to be credit dependent, so the stronger the organization, the more capital access it will have. Uh, unfortunately, uh, level of capital access does not necessarily, not necessarily correlate to level of, of community need. So hospitals in poor urban and rural areas frequently have less access to capital and therefore are less able to provide the services their, their citizens require of them. Um, the employer uh, payment model is, is uh, coming apart at the seams. Fewer companies offer insurance. Um, we've, those companies that do have been pushing more of the cost onto individuals. Uh, the health care reform bill in many respects was an insurance reform bill because it's going to try to get more people into the system and to some extent cushion the, uh, the cost for individuals of participating in the system so that with more people in the system there'll be a greater ability to spread risk and so individuals won't have to bear uh, the incremental costs, individual incremental costs of their disease, illness, or injury. Uh, lots of um, uh, pressure to improve quality, uh, keep uh, patient records private. Um, the whole issue of paying, uh, treating and paying for those without insurance or who don't have enough insurance and also being responsive to the market, sometimes referred to as consumerism. All of that is uh, placing extreme pressure on, on health systems to uh, modify the way they operate, improve the way they operate, uh, and do it with a greater level of transparency and efficiency. Because of all these pressures, uh, most people believe uh, that we will start to see industry consolidation uh, as the individual pressures on, or uh, as the pressure on individual hospitals, either because they can't access the debt markets to get necessary capital or can't uh, meet operational performance standards, uh, translates into a need to find a stronger partner. So we do expect that we will see um, consolidation as the industry transforms from where it is today, hopefully, to uh, a system that has. Uh, more efficient care delivery that is uh, measurable and delivers higher levels of, of quality, uh, quality outcomes at, at lower prices. Well, I hope we're able to do that because if you look at the demographics, they're really quite scary. Uh, Woodstock was 1969. Uh, the first baby boomer who was at Woodstock uh, turned 75 in 2021. Um, we have 4 million um, uh, boomers turning 50 per year. They will continue to migrate through the system. Uh, we now have broken that down by, uh, uh, by a day, hour, and minute. So seven a minute uh, turning, turning 50. Obviously, as people age, they tend to use uh, more health care services. Um, that combined with the fact that our lifestyle is leading to more levels of, of uh, chronic disease, most not notably diabetes, means that Absent uh, a, a fundamental change in our healthcare system, healthcare costs will continue to grow uh, at, great than, at a rate greater than inflation as the population ages and is disproportionately afflicted with chronic disease. So it's not enough to just reform the system and the way we treat people when they get sick. We also have to think about the broader healthcare of the, of the country and how do we prevent people from uh, developing chronic conditions in the first place, and then if they do uh, have chronic condition, how do we treat them in more uh, effective ways so that uh, the high cost uh, procedures in the health system uh, either get delayed or, or avoided altogether. Uh, so the demographics are scary, uh, so we have to address lifestyle as well as making the system more responsive in terms of uh, treating people when they are sick or injured. Uh, and for all of that, uh, as I said earlier, the U.S. spends more on, uh, on health care than, than other countries. This is 2007 data. Uh, so as a percent of GDP, uh, we're at 16 percent. France is the next highest at 11 percent. Of course, uh, U.S. per capita GDP is higher than that of any other country. We are the wealthiest, wealthiest country per capita, large country per capita in the world. Um, so on a per capita basis, the numbers are even greater than this. Uh, but we're up to 17% of GDP for healthcare right now, and yet when you look at some of the basic measures of, of uh, popula uh, a population's health, we score rather poorly. Um, 
In these charts, we're looking at the United States compared to France, Germany, United Kingdom, and Japan, so uh, four of the wealthier countries in the world. And you can see when it comes to infant mortality, we're significantly higher. When it comes to life expectancy at birth, we're significantly lower, and we're dramatically higher um, than other countries when you look at the percentage of our population that's obese. Uh, although the United Kingdom is, is uh, beginning to migrate uh, in our direction as well. So we spend more and get less. Uh, that gets back to the previous slide when I talked about chronic conditions, because clearly obesity is a factor, particularly childhood obesity now, truly scary, is a factor in the level of chronic care cost and the overall cost of our system. So we could create the most effective health care system in the world, and yet if we do nothing about our lifestyle, uh, the cost will continue to spiral out of control. So again, simultaneously addressing uh, the overall health of the population in communities as well as being more effective in delivering care when it's needed are the two main challenges confronting the, the, uh, the country as we try to reform the system. So the, the current care continuum, uh, multiple components, uh, frequently fragmented and suboptimal, and what I like about this chart is that it, it divides healthcare really into two broad components, what's needed and what's wanted. Um, and we start here on the left-hand side, uh, or I guess on the right-hand side of the chart, with, with acute episodes. And then once someone's released from the hospital, uh, the different post-acute uh, services they receive. And then as you get further out to the chart, we look at more of the things that are want-driven and preventative. Um, so things like... Um, uh, um, you know, independent living, uh, care coordination, and this is particularly focused on the, the uh, geriatric part of the population, but wellness, um, uh, nutrition, keeping people healthy when they do get sick, uh, getting them into alternative care settings quickly. So um, obviously when you're down on this side, uh, you need the care. We have to provide it in the most effective way. As you move toward this side of the chart, that's where we get more into wellness and prevention. Uh, this has an elderly focus to it, but it actually applies broadly to the population as a whole. Uh, healthcare costs, uh, uh, and specifically healthcare economics, are, are pretty interesting um, and counterintuitive. Uh, in almost every other industry, uh, investment in technology decreases cost. So just imagine your experience with uh, cell phones or personal computers. You're, you're now used to, uh, as, tech, as time goes by, being able to buy a more powerful machine for significantly less money. Um, the BlackBerry, which I uh, carry around today, uh, I, can, I can buy in my plan and get, get one for $49, and uh, they'll throw a second one in free. Two years ago, that same BlackBerry was $250. Million, or $250. Um, in healthcare, on the other hand, uh, technology almost always increases cost. Uh, the reason that happens um, is that the nature of the system pays for activity, not necessarily outcomes. So we are in this very strange circumstance where supply drives demand rather than how it usually works in the rest of the world where demand drives supply. This chart here looks at um, the incidence of cardiac treatment based on the number of cardiologists per 100,000 in population. And what you see by this analysis done by the Dartmouth Atlas is that the more cardiologists that um, exist in a particular region of the country, the higher the number of procedures. So we end up in a circumstance where supply of cardiologists or supply of imaging machines determines how many heart procedures or how many ima diagnostic imaging tests are done rather than uh, the demand, the inherent demand for those. So it's very possible and in fact happens all of the time where uh, a region of a country or a certain hospital will provide more care than is probably needed. And the reason for this is, is sometimes reduced to something called Romer's Law. Uh, Romer was a public policy analyst, healthcare policy analyst at UCLA in the 60s, who made the observation that supply may induce its own demand where a third party practically guarantees reimbursement of usage. 
So in the healthcare system, as you all know, when you get a treatment, uh, you fill out a form, it goes to your health insurance company, and by and large, they, they pay for the treatment. In Medicare, there are, there are no denials whatsoever. So doctors and hospitals are, are paid for on a productivity basis, it's not, on a, um, uh, not on an outcomes basis. This, became, uh, this, this particular issue got a lot of publicity a couple of years ago uh, when the U.S. News and World Report uh, published its uh, uh, five most or five best hospitals in the United States. They're cut off from here, uh, I guess, to protect the innocent. But it's it was UCLA um, in in California, Mass General, Johns Hopkins, the Cleveland Clinic, and the Mayo Clinic. UCLA here on the far end, and the Mayo Clinic here on the, the uh, uh, on the near end. Uh, and basically. Uh, what the Dartmouth Atlas did was looked at these five hospitals named by U.S. News and World Report and measured the cost of chronic care in the last two years of life. It's a pretty good proxy because by and large when people are sick in the last two years of life, they spend most of their health care expenditure in hospitals and with doctors, frequently specialists. And what this showed was that UCLA, the cost at UCLA was $94,000 and the cost at the Mayo Clinic was $53,000. So almost double. Uh, and in fact, at some academic medical centers, it was more than double, uh, as high as one hundred and five dollars or $110,000. Um, and the reason wasn't because health care costs more at UCLA than it does at, uh, at uh, the Mayo Clinic. Um, by and large, in Medicare, the unit prices are very similar. It just what it really means is that if you were at UCLA, you, you tended to get twice as much care as you did at the Mayo Clinic. Twice as many tests, uh, twice as many visits to specialists, twice as many days in the intensive care unit because it wasn't as coordinated. Mayo Clinic, on the other hand, has an employed medical staff, has a care philosophy of uh, doing what's necessary but no more than what's necessary. and a very strong culture that uh, respects end-of-life wishes for patients. So in that circumstance, with that level of, of uh, cultural discipline, Mayo Clinic is, again, almost half of the level of usage of, uh, of UCLA. There was an article earlier this year um, published in the New Yorker magazine by Atul Gawande that looked at health care expenditure in two cities in Texas, uh, McAllen and El Paso, Demographically the same, more or less, same number of people, uh, same ethnic distribution, same income distribution, um, same age and uh, distribution, and so on. Very similar. The health care costs in McAllen are twice per capita what they are in, uh, in El Paso. And a close inspection again reveals that it isn't the per unit cost, it's just if you happen to live in McAllen, given the practice patterns of the hospitals and doctor, you're, you're likely to get twice as much health care as you would in El Paso. Uh, Atul Gawande ended that article by saying, maybe what's remarkable isn't so much that uh, health care costs in McAllen are twice as much as they are in El Paso, because clearly there's an incentive to provide more care um, built into the payment to methodology if you're paid for activity and, and not for outcomes. But maybe what's remarkable is that more places in the country aren't like McAllen, uh, that you do have places like El Paso that, that do have care patterns that, uh, that seem to be more reasonable. So will this continue? That's the question he asked, given all the pressures. So dealing with this issue of overtreatment is, is a remarkably important one. Um, unnecessary tests cost the economy $210 billion a year. Um, payments for new medical technologies account for roughly half the increase in health care spending. Um, I had a, just to give you an example, I had a friend that uh, uh, now works for, for Kaiser Permanente, an integrated system, so it has insurance and hospitals and employed physicians. And he used to be the chief financial officer of a system in the Midwest. And, I was talking to him the other day, and he said, uh, guess how many uh, da Vinci machines I had for my four hospitals at my previous system. For those of you who don't know what a da Vinci machine is, that's a robotic surgical machine. So a physician can be in one room operating a joystick uh, and actually performing surgery on someone in another room. Very advanced technology, uh, allows 
um, uh, the sticks that are performing the surgery to get places a human hand can't go. And for certain types of, of treatment has revolutionized uh, healthcare. Uh, but it's also a favorite toy of physicians. And in many markets, physicians are demanding that their hospitals buy these Da Vinci machines. So um, my friend said, well, how many Da Vinci machines do you think I had for my four hospitals in, uh, in, at my old system? And the answer was five Da Vinci machines. And then he said, well, how many do you think I have for my 37 hospitals at Kaiser Permanente? And I said, well, I don't know, but I guess you're going to tell me a low number. And he said, you're right. We have two Da Vinci machines for 37 hospitals at Kaiser Permanente. So Kaiser, an integrated model uh, that worries about the overall expenditure, that's able to think about medical usage and appropriateness and focus on outcomes, make intermediate decisions, had two for 37 hospitals, whereas this other health system had five for four hospitals. Again, that's an indication of how technology uh, frequently uh, the supply of technology drives demand rather than vice versa. So I know I spent a long time on this, but this issue around healthcare economics, not terribly well understood, but getting the economics in healthcare right, the appropriate amount of treatment for the conditions in the right setting is remarkably important to the ultimate outcome or, or improvement in the system. Uh, so let's, um, let's talk about technology. Uh, healthcare technology, um, by and large, underinvested and underperforming. So look at these things that we've come to experience in our everyday life, uh, using an ATM, uh, paying a bill online, checking in at the airport. Uh, you know, you can be in Russia, and uh, you need some rubles, so you pull out your, your, your bank credit card from Chase or Bank of America or Citi, um, and you put it in a machine, and you punch a few numbers, and you want 200 rubles, and after 30 seconds, uh, the rubles come out of the machine. And in that time, uh, the bank or the machine has contacted your bank, made sure you had money in there, made sure you are the person uh, associated with this card, has done the currency conversion, and then distributed the funds. Remarkably complex series of operations done in a few seconds um, based on a remarkable degree of connectivity in IT. On the other hand, uh, think about your experience when you're uh, registering at a hospital or scheduling an appointment. Or think about medical records that here we are in 2010, and 90% of medical records are still on paper. People died in New Orleans uh, during Katrina because records on paper floated away, and we couldn't treat them. Uh, the fact that today we don't have electronic medical records uh, across the board is a real indictment of the system. Interestingly, the, the Veterans Administration um, does have electronic medical records for all people in that system. Uh, Part of the reason they're able to do that is the Veterans Administration, as I said earlier, is socialized medicine, so they don't worry about having to link uh, medical uh, information with billing. So that t linking medical information with billing makes it a much more complex operation. And many systems are making enormous progress in this area, but we're still burdened by too much paper. Uh, understanding a hospital bill, uh, I defy people to uh, understand a hospital bill, and of course all of the administrative coverage that goes back and forth as, as people work it out. So when it comes to information technology, underinvested, underperforming. Um, the current health care reform bill uh, allocates significant amount of funding to try to upgrade information technology. There is hope that with improved technology we will get uh, better measurement, uh, better ability to assess um, uh, treatment and ultimately direct resources to the most effective uh, treatment area. Uh, and this is also very important, because uh, as we find out, when patients have, uh, are, are paying the bill themselves, uh, to use the, uh, uh, the current terminology, have skin in the game, it turns out that they're very sensitive to prices. So the willingness of patients to pay more uh, for a preferred primary care physician or a specialist uh, goes down dramatically as the bill, uh, as the amount increases from 20 to 40 to 60 dollars. So the impl implications as we get more transparency around pricing is that 
there will be demand migration to lower cost delivery options, less ability to cross subsidize uh, the way hospitals do now. They tend to take money from higher paying patients and use it to subsidize care for lower paying patients. And there'll be more correlation between price and service levels. Um, so this system, as we move toward more transparency, uh, will lead to um, different use patterns. Now all of this isn't bad, um, isn't bad at all. Uh, perhaps this will lead to uh, a vast expansion of uh, what are sometimes called minute, minute clinics uh, or mini clinics in places like Target or Walgreens or CVS, uh, where for very basic things like earaches and strep throat, uh, you can see a technician. The price will be on the wall. Uh, it's very clear what the, uh, what the treatment is and it will happen in a routine manner close to home um, for significantly less money. Uh, we will see that migration in, uh, for simple things uh, into these alternative lower cost, uh, very uh, appropriate care settings. And when you think about it, particularly in underserved areas, uh, medically underserved areas, the more of the basic care that we can provide in uh, places close to home that are very convenient, uh, will actually dramatically improve uh, care for those communities because an earache that goes untreated uh, can become a chronic infection and, and lead to an emergency room visit. Better to get it uh, treated for $10 at your local CVS or Walmart uh, than to have to wait for it to fester and ultimately result in an emergency room treatment. So uh, as we move into a world where patients are more responsible for payment uh, and there's more transparency around pricing, we will see migration of services to alternative settings. Again, this can, this can be a positive force. So as we sit here today, um, you know, an overused phrase, the new normal, um, we're looking at a world of greater volatility. Uh, the current state, as we saw when we looked at UCLA and, uh, and the Mayo Clinic, or we looked at McAllen, Texas and El Paso, te Texas, tolerates very high variation uh, in almost any way you look at it. Uh, more care, the price for care, uh, the level of services, and so on. Um, part of this results because I think uh, fundamentally we want our local hospitals and doctors to be stable. We want them to be there when we need them. So we have a bias for stability, yet this comes at a very high cost and a maldistribution of facilities and practitioners. So our desire to um, always have our hospital, local hospital, and our local doctor be there when we need them uh, leads us to, to tolerate this high variation. And this is supported by a production-based payment system, so we pay for activity, we don't pay for outcomes. Um, the fact that we let hospitals borrow at tax-exempt uh, rates, very low cost, um, and most nonprofit organizations, investment income subsidizes operation provides a little bit of a barrier to market forces. Uh, there are regulatory barriers. Uh, several years ago, for example, Congress instituted a moratorium on specialty hospitals, uh, which were uh, very competitive against general hospitals, so it prevented uh, organizations from building orthopedic hospitals or cardiac hospitals to compete with a general hospital in town. Um, so regulatory barriers do pre prevent uh, 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 market disruption from changing service models, changing business models. Uh, and we've, as we've said, there is uh, limited accountability and standardization has proven, proven difficult. But this current state seems to be succumbing to uh, uh, demands for, for better quality, outcomes measure, measurement, uh, uh, greater access, the fact that we want to control costs and we want broader community health focus. We want to keep people healthy as well as treat them when they're sick. So the future state probably means for most hospitals greater operating volatility, uh, winners and losers, uh, those that do it well getting rewarded, those that, doing, that do poorly getting punished, increased penalties for things like uh, readmission if, uh, for infections, uh, increased penalties for over, over treatment. Uh, that will lead to or more in organizational stress, uh, uh, industry restructuring, and probably consolidation and I think we'll start to see new performance metrics as we shift from a system that, that focuses mostly on treating people when they're sick to one that thinks more broadly about community, keeping communities healthy. 
Uh, so we have, in near term anyway, greater volatility as we move from a, our current state that tolerates high variation to a system that is more focused on, uh, on outcomes measurement, quality mandates, and keeping costs under control. But as we stand here today uh, and look at the system, long term, uh, you have to wonder about its sustainability. The things you'd like to be going up or going down, so we, uh, we have fewer employers providing coverage, less coverage per individual, less access, lower consumer satisfaction, and the things that you want to be going down or going up, more uninsured, medical inflation, uh, unfavorable demographics uh, uh, as the society ages, more chronic disease, um, and Medicare, Medicaid underfunding, government underfunding. Uh, so absent change, um, the system appears unsustainable. Uh, the question is, with health care reform, which will certainly bring more people into the system, will it fundamentally change this imbalance? Uh, as we stand here today, uh, Ford Motor Company spends more annually on health care costs than it does on steel for its cars. Um, will we continue to burden American industry with high cost health care and make it uncompetitive relative to the rest of the world? Or will we begin to uh, disrupt the system and, and make it uh, more effective and more efficient? Um, so that sort of ends the, the section on uh, the structure of American health care. Uh, hopefully at this point you have an understanding that uh, at some levels the system's absolutely remarkable in the care that it delivers. Uh, the technology, uh, the innovation, the drugs, the ability to do things to keep people alive or to keep uh, or allow them to function uh, today uh, in a much uh, more uh, effective way than even five years ago. But at the same time a system burdened by high cost uh, maldistribution of facilities and practitioners um, behind the times relative to other industries and investment in information technology and standardization uh, and really a system that if we are going to uh, uh, keep it under control uh, really needs to uh, fundamentally change. Uh, fundamentally change in ways that keep people healthy and out of the hospital and when they are in the hospital uh, or some other place, treats them efficiently without letting them go back in. Um, so that's where we are from a structure perspective. So we're going to shift now to why is this system the way it is? How did it, how did it get this way? The character of American health care. Um, this is, a, this is a, a really interesting chart. Um, it had its origins over 20 years ago. I, I was asked to give a talk um, to a group of legislators and uh, public health officials in the state of New Jersey. And one of the things they asked me to discuss was, why is the American health care system the way it is? We already found out it's not like Canada. It's not like Europe. It's not like Japan. Uh, it's uniquely American. Why is it the way it is? And to tell you the truth, I'd never thought about that question. And it's three weeks before the presentation, and I, I've got nothing. It's uh, two weeks, I've got nothing. It's one week, I've got nothing. And finally, um, three days before I'm scheduled to talk, I started jotting down what I thought were some quintessential American values. And you can see them arrayed here around the country that uh, Americans tend to be very good in a crisis, but have an aversion to central planning. So, uh, you know, you sometimes read about these remarkable stories where uh, conjoined twins um, are born in uh, somewhere in the Midwest, and uh, a, a philanthropist lends them their Learjet to fly them to a children's hospital in Mi Miami, where a remarkable surgery separates the twins, and they go on to lead uh, full. Uh, very productive lives, and everybody is overwhelmed by the generosity, the responsiveness in the crisis, and so on. And yet, at the same time, uh, we're we're by and large terrible at prenatal planning. It's uh, uh, we leave it up to the individual, and as a result, those at the margins of society typically don't uh, receive good prenatal care. And as a result, we have more uh, well, premature infants born, more infant mortality, and so on. So, good in a crisis, but an aversion to central planning. Um, we distrust uh, government but like competitive markets. Uh, 
Uh, how many times in the last year have you heard the phrase government run health care? Uh, my favorite sign at one of the uh, Tea Party rallies was keep your government hands off my Medicare. Of course, Medicare is a government run program. Uh, but we, we tend to distrust government, uh, have a, a, a natural uh, distaste of too much government. Uh, even Bill Clinton, um, you know, a, a strong Democrat, obviously, uh, said in one of his later State of the Union uh, addresses that the era of big government is over. And of course, in the last year, as the financial markets crumbled and the banks got into trouble, several companies went out of business, it was really government that that came to uh, the rescue by pumping trillions of dollars into the system and uh, really coming up with many creative solutions to uh, a real challenge that the current Fed Chairman Bernanke says was greater than the challenge we faced during the Great Depression. Um, so that whole issue of the size and role of government is again before us because government has been more active in the last year and a half as it has responded to the financial crisis. So distrust of big government, trust in, uh, trust in the markets. Although I will say the, the markets have been dented a little bit by, uh, by what's happened in the last couple of years. Um, a desire to be the, we to be the best, uh, uh, you know, we're number one. That goes with a strong focus on individualism. Uh, as a country, uh, we tend to revere the individual at the expense of the group. Um, unusual. Uh, I'm part of a, um, I'm on the board uh, or on the audit committee for Christus Health System, a large Catholic health system in, in Texas. Uh, Christus every five years engages in a futures exercise where it goes around the world and around the country uh, talking to experts to get a feel for where healthcare is going. And, uh, uh, and then uses the results of that futures task force to uh, govern its strategic plan. I think it's a, a brilliant exercise and has done very well for the system through the years. Um, they did the, uh, their last futures task force was in 2008. They spent some time in Canada, Toronto to be specific. And uh, the general impression after talking to experts and citizens and practitioners in Canada uh, was basically that uh, Canada is a rich country. Uh, there's enough to go around. Uh, we believe in, in equal access. Um, and if that means we as individuals have to wait a little bit longer or some s types of service aren't available to us, we're okay with that. We, by and large, uh, uh, respect our healthcare system and admire what it does for the people and, and believe in it and support it. In fact, um, Canada ran a, uh, a whole series of programs a little bit like American Idol where they uh, nominated people from across the country, uh, could do it randomly, for, uh, to select uh, the greatest Canadian in history. Uh, and this went on for several months and uh, uh, it got down to the last show where they had the final 10 uh, Canadians and, and uh, phones were ringing and the polls coming in. And among the, uh, among the final 10 uh, uh, people nominated for the greatest Canadian ever were Wayne Gretzky, the hockey player. Um, uh, I think it was Tommy, Fo Tommy Fox, the, uh, uh, the runner with, um, with one leg who ran across the entire uh, uh, country of Canada to raise money and, and awareness for cancer. Uh, you know, remarkably courageous individual. And uh, Alexander Graham Bell, uh, many of you probably didn't know, I didn't know was Canadian, but the, the inventor of the telephone. But the, per the person that, uh, that all of Canada selected just a couple of years ago as the greatest Canadian in their history was a gentleman named Tommy Douglas, who as Prime Minister of, Sk or, uh, of Saskatchewan um, introduced uh, health service to all the people in Saskatchewan. It's called Medicare, surprisingly enough. And then became Prime Minister of all of Canada and introduced national health or, or Medicare to the entire country. Uh, so the Canadian people, as recently as, as uh, two years ago, invited or uh, elected uh, the, uh, the founder of their National Health Service as the greatest person in the history of their, their country. Um, how long do you think that sort of uh, greater good concept would last uh, uh, just south of the, the Canadian border? Uh, I don't think it would last a nanosecond. Uh, we as Americans want our health care. We want it now. We want access to the best. 
Uh, we don't really care as much about what other people are getting. We want to just make sure it's there for us and our families. Uh, so this individualistic focus is, is very much a part of who we are, for better or for worse. And I think if you were to really probe deeply into the motivations of Americans and try to answer the question, why do we tolerate 50 million people without health care insurance, I think at some level, maybe even below conscious level, the answer would be um, we think it's people's own fault if they don't have health care insurance. Same thing applies to poverty. It's this bring yourself up by your bootstraps mentality, uh, the belief in America that um, we give people what they need to succeed. Uh, many do so brilliantly, but those who don't, at some level, it's their own fault. Uh, very, very strong um, individualism individualistic focus. But at the same time, we do rally around our communities. The uh, vast majority of health care is delivered in this country by community hospitals. People volunteer at the hospitals. They tend to be governed by nonprofit boards of local leaders. Very large uh, philanthropic contributions given. We, do, we are very community oriented. I think the two actually go together because as the country developed and moved westward, there weren't strong governmental organizations. So people tended to band together and form community associations, which ultimately grew into things like hospitals and universities and so on. And even to this day, we were remarkably supportive of our community, uh, uh, of our communities. So this unique combination of individualism and community support uh, uh, goes side by side. Instant gratification, uh, don't really need to spend much time on that. Uh, Americans, uh, as I said, want what they want, and they want it now, and they're willing to pay for it. We do have this strong charitable, uh, or charitable tradition, which I was just talking about, uh, really dwarfs what you see in almost any other country. Uh, Americans' commitment to philanthropy uh, is remarkable. It is supported by the tax code, but even above and beyond that, uh, we're the envy of other countries around the world by the extent to which people individually give uh, to, to support charities of their, of their choosing. Uh, interestingly, this is the flip side, I think, to the distrust of big government. We would rather leave it to our charitable organizations uh, that are closer to home that we can support to distribute uh, the benefits to, uh, of our largesse to society than rely on the government to do it in a broad-based way. Uh, remarkable faith in technology. Um, you know, uh, maybe this goes with instant gratification, but uh, there are many people that uh, rather than uh, do the hard work of diet and exercise, would hope we'd come up with a pill that would, uh, would solve their particular illness uh, or injury. But uh, uh, we, we do love our machines. We love our technology. We, we want the latest. And that, without the break of the marketplace, is part of the reason why you end up with uh, five da Vinci machines and four hospitals in, the, in one city in the Midwest. Um, left to our own resources, though, we, we, do, we are pragmatic and innovative people. Um, we've led the world in, in, uh, uh, in building universities and creating new technologies and uh, shaping companies that are the envy of the world. Um, and uh, that's a very strong part of our tradition as well. Uh, and then uh, belief in miracles like the conjoined twins. By the way, just a coincidence that this comes out of uh, Southern California. So I've taken a long time to explain this chart. Uh, but when you look at it, if you believe that these are uh, quintessential American values, is it really so surprising that in this country of ours that you can get the best health care in the world that money can buy, that it uh, uh, delivers remarkable technological innovation, that it's very responsive to incentives, that it has a for-profit, free market, competitive uh, component, that it's increasingly consumer-oriented, that it uh, receives unmatched philanthropic support? but at the same time consumes 17 percent of, uh, of our economy or our GDP, um, has this uneven distribution of, of facilities and practitioners, tolerates uh, 45 plus million people without insurance, uh, that uh, puts the individual ahead of the group that tends to assign blame for personal failure and has significant practice and service variation. Um, so the answer to that question 20 years ago, uh, why do we have the healthcare system we do, is look in the mirror. It reflects who we are as a people, uh, our experience, our history, our attitudes, our beliefs. And is that really so surprising that something that consumes 17% of our economy is, is, is inherently a reflection of our, our, our values? 
Uh, one last story about this chart. Um, as uh, Ellen mentioned in the introduction, I, I co-wrote a paper um, with Nancy Kane, uh, dean at the School of Public Health, and I've been teaching in, in Nancy's cl uh, class off and on for uh, for about 20 years. And, and Nancy just loves this chart, and we got uh, offered the chance to present a paper at a conference a couple of years ago. And she said, called me up and said, "Why don't we write a paper around your chart?" And I said, "Sure." So we divided it up and 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 wrote the paper. Actually, just got published as part of a book uh, by Oxford Press uh, uh, about healthcare fragmentation. Um, but anyway, earlier this year, uh, Nancy, uh, who serves on the board of Press Ganey, uh, was invited by Press Ganey to debate Newt Gingrich at their national conference on healthcare reform. 1,600 people in the audience, and the only visual uh, uh, in that uh, debate, and it was left up for the entire debate, was, was this chart. Uh, and uh, interestingly, Nancy, who uh, is a, a MedPAC uh, commissioner has been very involved in payment reform in Massachusetts and on the national level. Uh, and Newt Gingrich, uh, who's obviously a very pro-market oriented uh, 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 advocate for health care reform, uh, agreed that our health care system reflects who we are. By and large, uh, agreed to this uh, uh, diagnostic uh, approach to the health care system, but of course had remarkably different uh, ideas about what to do to fix the system. Uh, so at the end of the day, um, uh, through 20 years, this, this chart has served me very well as I've tried to understand myself and explain to audiences like this one, why do we have the healthcare system we do? Uh, hopefully you found this, this helpful. Um, as we dig down a little bit and look at the core building blocks, uh, one is the, the community hospital, the other is going to be the primary care physician. Um, but the, the core building block on the delivery side is the community hospital. About 80% of U.S. hospitals are either nonprofit or governmental ownership structure. Uh, and even those that are for-profit tend to be very community oriented. Um, uh, the no certainly on the nonprofit side, uh, we have local boards of, uh, of, that uh, govern the institutions. They usually come from or, or, or uh, are staffed by uh, business leaders uh, from the community. Uh, they tend to have a mission orientation, uh, sometimes called a community benefit. So it's uh, providing care for those that can't pay, training doctors, educating the community, conducting basic research, remarkably important things. Um, hospitals tend to be large employers. They also tend to be the focus for a lot of philanthropy. philanthropy. Um, so when you look at community hospitals, they tend to be uh, very strong, have very strong local branding. Uh, here we are in Chicago. Imagine a gold-plated name like Northwestern or the University of Chicago as a place to get your health care. Incredibly strong brand. Uh, their strategic orientation tends to be vertical as opposed to horizontal. And by that I mean more services in a community rather than doing what most businesses do, which is to expand horizontally based on scale and specialization. Uh, in nonprofit healthcare and hospitals, hospitals tend to want to do more in a vertical fashion in a community. So everything from uh, the most advanced surgery uh, to giving you shots before you go on your European vacation uh, and everything in between, behavioral health, uh, um, uh, delivering babies, uh, 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 even sometimes uh, some of the, the, the wellness related activities uh, related to nutrition and, and education. So a vertical strategic orientation. We do have this cross subsidy funding model. As I said earlier, um, hospitals and doctors receive different payments for providing the same uh, procedure or treatment. We, we tend to have more payment um, from uh, commercial insurers than we do from the government. So it's not unusual for a, a, a commercial insurer, someone who pays for the insurance like for me or, or for many of you, uh, to pay 130 or 140 or even 150 percent of the cost. And that in turn helps cover hospitals for their cost of, of providing for government payers like Medicare, which typically pays about 80 percent of cost, or Medicaid, which is even lower. And of course, for the medically, so uh, 
cross-subsidy funding model, and then, as I said, significant tax benefits, in part to help compensate um, hospitals for treating the indigent. So um, the community hospital is the build building block, vertical strategic orientation, uh, nonprofit, um, and in many respects, how we what we built our healthcare system around. I think if we were starting today from scratch, we would not put the philanthropic component on the delivery side. We'd put it on the payment side. But in our world today, because of the way the system has evolved, it is on the delivery side. So this whole uh, cross-subsidy funding model, the uh, provision of all of these community benefits, and then the uh, correlation between that community benefit and the tax benefits uh, is a remarkably intricate uh, relationship and increasingly coming under scrutiny. I would say hospitals in the last six or seven years have increasingly been brought to, uh, uh, or been um, uh, scrutinized relating to uh, their tax status, the level of, of benefit they provide. Uh, the Senate has done this. The Internal Revenue Service has done this. The SEC has done this. The Attorney General in Illinois has done this. In fact, uh, we just held up, had upheld at the, uh, the appellate court level the revocation of a hospital's tax-exempt status downstate in, uh, in Urbana uh, because the court decided that the tax benefits it was receiving were uh, overwhelmingly greater than the uh, cost of the indigent care it was providing, and they revoked its tax-exempt status. Um, so hospitals under increasing uh, scrutiny, but a building block of our community health system. Uh, primary care physicians um, are the principal vehicle for orchestrating care. Uh, the core unit of service is the office visit. I'm sure you're all familiar with that. Um, and payment to, uh, to physician is based on their services rendered. Uh, look at all the things we ask um, primary care physicians to do. As I mentioned earlier, the, the, the earache, a very straight uh, forward diagnosis and treatment. If your child wakes up with an earache uh, and you want treatment, you typically have to call your primary care physician, go see uh, him or her, uh, get a diagnosis, get, uh, get some medicine for treatment. Could be done in lower cost settings, but right now is primarily done through primary care physicians. We ask them to oversee uh, patients with chronic disease. Uh, so regular visits, uh, maybe once a month, maybe once a quarter to a physician to monitor this chronic condition. Uh, unfortunately, chronic disease, just given the nature, and we spend three quarters of our healthcare budget on chronic disease, really requires almost daily uh, intervention. It lends itself to a facilitated network rather than these periodic office visits. Uh, there might be behavioral modification. People need to eat less or eat differently. They might need to get reminded to take medication. Uh, they might need special types of, of exercise or, or rehabilitation. Uh, they might benefit from having a, a group of, of people with the same disease or illness uh, to compare notes to or with. Um, but we also, right now, by and large, rely on the primary care system to take care of people with chronic disease. And we also um, um, go once a year for our physical, uh, and that's probably the most important thing that we ask primary care physicians to do is to make sure that we're, we're, we're well and in, in, in a good functioning order. And then when we aren't, to do the preliminary identification of acute disease and injury, a form of intuitive medicine, the highest really uh, form of medicine in many respects is trying to deduce from all of the possible conditions the one that happens to be affecting the patient in front of them. Um, interestingly, the pattern of um, Employment in medicine uh, as people graduate from medical school has shifted uh, remarkably in favor of specialty care, uh, better lifestyle, uh, more income uh, than primary care. So we have a shortage of primary care physicians that we by and large fill through foreign medical graduates and uh, graduates of, of uh, osteopathic hospitals or osteopathic medical schools. Uh, but interestingly, uh, the primary care physician is, because of this need to diagnose and direct, plays a vital component in the system, and we may be shortchanging ourselves long run by pushing more people into specialty care and not into primary care. 
um, nonprofit hospitals, that core building block, uh, uh, have a form of mission and margin schizophrenia. As I said, we ask them to provide these significant uh, community benefits, uh, care for the indigent, conduct basic research, train doctors, educate the community. But at the same time, we force them out into the free capital markets to raise money. They have to employ somebody like me, and I can tell you from uh, over 20 years of doing this, the, uh, uh, it's impossible to overstate how narrow the focus is of the organizations and institutions that buy hospital debt. All they care about at the end of the day is will the hospital repay them and what interest rate are they going to receive. They really do not care about the mission aspects uh, that the hospital fulfills. Uh, so we end up with this uh, really complex managerial challenge where individuals running hospitals today simultaneously have to think about meeting the community benefit and yet being efficient and uh, uh, proficient enough to um, uh, generate profits and enter the capital market. So it's, it's a real intricate balancing act. And as we become more and more market oriented, uh, it's become harder in some respects for um, hospitals to match the needs of their community with the business and services that, that provide the most income. Uh, a real challenge to manage in this environment. Very different from the for-profit challenge, which uh, is very clear when you're a for-profit organization, your, your charge is to enrich shareholder value and to generate profits that are uh, then reinvested in the business. Um, so hats off to nonprofit administrators, they, they have a tough job. Uh, having just mentioned for-profit, uh, uh, there's a culture clash that frequently occurs between nonprofit providers and for-profit providers. Uh, you see it frequently in the handoff from hospitals, which tend to be nonprofit, to nursing homes and LTACs, long-term care, acute care hospitals, rehab hospitals, uh, home health agencies, which by and large are for-profit, and they, they, they look back and forth at each other, or sometimes between nonprofit hospitals and for-profit hospitals. Um, and they have competing visions. Nonprofit mythology is that uh, for-profit providers are greedy, unconcerned with quality. They only answer to their shareholders. They're not sensitive to community needs. Um, the for-profit mythology is that nonprofit providers are overstaffed, inefficient, inefficient uh, secretive with regard to their public disclosure. And, and frequently small-minded, uh, not able to think uh, about adaptation and reform. Uh, and each sector has significant advantages. Uh, obviously, in the nonprofit sector, no taxes, no dividends to shareholders, lower access to uh, or lower cost financing through tax-exempt bonds. They're able to keep strong cash reserves, tend to have community support and less market scrutiny. Uh, For-profit competitive advantage, obviously, the ability to raise equity uh, capital uh, a much wider uh, array of, of funding vehicles uh, from equity to debt and everything in between, different types of warrants. Um, uh, the, because their disclosure is better and the markets are more liquid, they tend to have greater capital access at equivalent rating levels. So a taxable A issue will get better market reception than a tax-exempt uh, A issue, even though they have the same overall rating. Uh, they tend to be focused on... on uh, uh, on, on generating profits, so uh, greater levels of efficiency, and tend to be motivated to create more uh, uh, effective partnerships uh, in some respects uh, because, again, of the, the bottom line focus. Uh, so uh, a little bit of tension in this relationship. Uh, I think in, in many respects the organizations are more alike than they, they, like, than they like to admit, but again, uh, as someone once so brilliantly said, when uh, when strategy meets the or, or uh, when strategy and culture conflict, uh, uh, culture eats strategy for breakfast. Uh, um, so, if we're going to look for these worlds to collaborate in a way they, that we really do need better ways to to bring the parts together. Um, uh, as I said earlier, we we uh, we've we've talked for a long time about. Um, how to get activity out of high-cost hospital into alternative settings. In many respects, this has been going on for 30 years. Uh, the percentage of the health care budget uh, in 1980 spent on hospitals was about 45 percent. Today, it's about a third. Um, it's my sense that health care reform 
will actually uh, uh, accelerate this trend. So hospitals um, will continually be under pressure to keep people out in the first place and once they're in to get them into alternative care settings quickly and effectively. Um, and sort of within all of this is a, a basic um, um, couple of theses uh, about, uh, about market-driven systems. Uh, so those that are profitable um, get access to capital, get backing, uh, get to be stronger and become consolidators in their industry. And capital tends to flow the services and systems that generate the highest margins. So uh, we re reward stronger hospitals and, and money tends to flow to services that are more profitable. So as we move on in under the current system, we'll, this 30-year trend of getting activity out of hospitals and into alternative se settings will continue. And um, we will see capital flow into parts of the system that generate the highest margins. Uh, in many respects, this, this happens today. And it's interesting what the effect is. What we have on this chart um, is a distribution of ratings, uh, credit ratings. And for those who aren't aware of credit ratings, every issue of debt carries a credit rating. The highest rating is, is AAA. Uh, a is below AAA. Triple B is, is below A. And once you go below the triple B category, you're into kind of junk bond status. So double B, C, and so on. Um, most people tend to look at ratings on an annual basis. Are they are there more credit rating upgrades or more credit rating downgrades to kind of get a feel for is the market improving for hospitals or not? Um, is money going to flow more easily to hospitals or not? This is a little bit different approach. This is time series data. So we're looking at the distribution of, of all healthcare ratings by Moody's Investor Service, the largest uh, rater of hospitals in 1990. That's the blue line. And uh, then again in 2008, this is the, the gold line. And what we see in, in um, uh, 1990, uh, a more regulated environment, is that most ratings, or that ratings centered on the A category. Um, they, um, uh, but the curve is much steeper. So in language of statistics, which I know many of you are familiar with, we had narrower tables. So we had most people in and around the A category um, some down here at the lower end of the credit spectrum and some down here at the, at the higher end. Uh, fast forward to 2008, we have a much shallower distribution, still centered on the A category, but more winners, uh, AA and better, and certainly more losers uh, uh, at the triple B and lower scale. So uh, increasingly, uh, the market determines uh, which health systems are strong and which are weak. And as I said earlier, capital flows to the strong at the expense of the weak. Capital flows to projects that generate cash flow. So given this market orientation of capital access, we would expect over time uh, to see hospitals making decisions at the margins in services that generate the highest level of profits. And as I said earlier, that may or may not correspond to um, what communities need. So as we become more market oriented, we run the risk of having hospitals and doctors providing services that are lucrative but not necessarily uh, uh, compatible with the absolute health care needs of the communities they serve. Uh, and this is, uh, this is where we're going to end, uh, end the discussion today. Um, so having looked at our health care system, you know, its structure, its, uh, its flaws, its strengths, and why it got here. Um, and and uh, before we begin to think about what, where it's going, uh, I thought I'd spend just a moment on, on, uh, on value. Uh, how do you measure value? I think in most of, our, most of us uh, are very adept consumers, and we need two things to measure value. Uh, uh, and even a, most economists agree on this. You need a price, and you need a product or an outcome. And based on the price and the product or the outcome, we make a judgment on value. Uh, we like one car more than another car. We like one toaster more than another toaster. Uh, we like one massage service or one uh, uh, 
uh, beauty salon more than another. Uh, we're willing to pay more if the, if the uh, service or treatment is better. Um, so value is a function of price and outcome. Unfortunately, in healthcare, uh, pricing is, is opaque, uh, except in very few circumstances. It's, it's hard to know exactly how much uh, you're paying for healthcare. And uh, the outcomes measurement is in its very early stages. So our ability to tell whether we're receiving good care for a good price is, um, is difficult. And it's made even more complex by the fact that most of us don't pay directly for our health care services. We have a third party doing that on our behalf. But at the end of the day, when you think about health care, uh, broadly from a societal perspective, we would hope that health care would move in a direction that would lead to higher quality at a lower cost, uh, that's very responsive to individuals when they need it most, uh, that isn't overly responsive uh, and provides more care than they need, and that generally increases access. And I'm going to end um, with, a, with a quote from uh, Cardinal Bernadine, Cardinal Joseph Bernadine. Uh, for those of you who don't know, he was the Archbishop uh, and Cardinal in Chicago, um, had a uh, uh, remarkable interest in health care, ultimately died of cancer and used his um, uh, personal experience with cancer treatment as a teaching lesson for the broader community. And here's something he wrote uh, near his death in, in 1995 in a pamphlet about, about health care. And he said, I am becoming increasingly concerned that our health care delivery system is rapidly commercializing itself and in the process is abandoning core values that should always be at the heart of health care. Health care is fundamentally different from most other goods and services because it addresses the most human and intimate needs of people, their families, and communities. In essence, what I think he's saying is uh, we give health care, uh, uh, to some extent, a free pass. Uh, it's so important to us um, that we want to believe that our doctors and our hospitals are doing uh, the absolute best they can for us. And we do not and have not held uh, the providers of care to the same standards that we hold other um, uh, providers of, of products and services to in, 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 our, in our daily life. Uh, an example of this was uh, around this same time, maybe a couple of years later, some of you may, rem may remember this, that um, uh, Ford Explorer had uh, uh, Firestone tires on its, uh, um, on, its, uh, on its Ford Explorers, and they had a tendency to uh, blow out at inconvenient times and actually led to uh, uh, several, several deaths. Terrible publicity for Ford, terrible pl publicity for Firestone, uh, cost the companies tens of millions of dollars. Um, but when all was said and done, the number of people who died because Ford and Firestone didn't get it right in their quality uh, for their tires and the Ford Explorer was, was under 100. It was in the 70s. At around the same time, the Institute of Medicine um, uh, came out with a report that said that uh, hospitals killed somewhere in the neighborhood of 100,000 people a year um, uh, through medication errors, through infections that were preventable and so on. But anyway, 100,000 people a year died in hospitals that, that shouldn't have. Um, and yet, think of the penalty uh, society uh, took from Ford and Firestone in the terms of, uh, uh, of uh, decline in their stock price and uh, uh, the loss to their reputation and so on because we have such high standards for what we expect in our manufacturers. Um, and at the same time that study came out, uh, Institute of Medicine and, and uh, got a lot of publicity, got a lot of coverage, still does, but by and large has not uh, really changed uh, the individual attitude toward healthcare. We, we want to believe that we are constantly getting the best care we can. Um, so I think that's what Cardinal Bernadine is getting at when he said uh, uh, it addresses the most human and intimate needs of people, their families, and their communities. Uh, but you just saw, he died in 1995, wrote this in 1995, and you just saw that chart I put up on the difference between uh, market uh, or, or health care credit distribution in 2008 versus 1990. Um, and we clearly have a more market-oriented system today than we did in the early 90s and mid-90s. And 
I sometimes wonder what uh, Cardinal Bernadine would say about our system today and his concern that it's uh, rapidly commercializing itself and abandoning core values. So this relationship between the community and its hospitals, the community and its doctors, uh, providing the right level of services in the right way um, in a cost-effective, outcomes-oriented process uh, is coming under attack. It's coming under attack at the government level. It's coming under attack uh, uh, from uh, policy specialists and beginning to sow some seeds of doubt uh, regarding the ability of the system to meet the basic care needs of, of, of the people it serves. Um, so as we go through health care reform, as we begin to wrestle with these very large issues, I think we do need to come back to this question of value and what we expect out of our health systems and how the health systems can transform themselves as they go through their uh, transformation process as they re respond to health care reform in ways that uh, make more transparent the care they provide, uh, the level of quality that comes with that care, the price of that, and in so doing be much more responsive uh, to greater numbers of people. Uh, so that's, um, that's the end of the first session. As I said, we, today we address the structure of the American healthcare system and how it got that way. We've ended with this, this question of value. Uh, value is a very good way to lead into the, uh, to the next discussion, which will be on markets, uh, the role of, of uh, markets in healthcare provision, uh, the role of markets in access to debt, how organizations assess risk, how they manage uncertainty, and so on. Uh, and so uh, with that, I will leave you until next week, and, and thank you very much.